Any questions? Yes. So on Blackboard, there's no thing that's on for grades. There's no what? So the sign board doesn't have that usual tools and then like grades. Okay, I made some things disappear so I'll so they wouldn't be cluttering it up. Maybe maybe I accidentally made one disappear that you guys have access to. You were able to see your grade? Well explain tell him. Hmm. Well, apparently Manish can see his grades, but yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll yeah. I wish I could log in as you. You know, if you're having a problem, and and then I could see what's going on, but I don't have to do that. Any other questions? Okay, just a reminder, a week from today is our first prelim. Another reminder, if you're, if, you have, if you're one of those people with a direct class conflict, please email me as soon as possible because I want to synchronize the folks who have that. And... To get us some chalk here. Okay. So anyway, we're... <coughs> Starting to talk about some quote unquote interesting new math, and, and I'm trying to make it palatable by essentially contextualizing it with Fourier series, which we've all seen before, and we've all seen it in various forms. And so the way I say this is Fourier series and periodic signals and all that stuff as a vehicle. for orthogonal expansions in inner product spaces. And so what I did last time was I started, almost finished in fact, a real quick boom, 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 bullet point highlight reel about Fourier series, periodic signals, and all that kind of thing. So we sort of had this highlight list, highlight real, periodic signals, slash fundamental period, slash et cetera. OK? And one new piece of notation I introduced was this capital X sub T0. And that's always going to mean the set of all decent signals. And we're, we're assuming, by the way, for, for the, this part of the course, that everything is complex valued. So this is a set of all decent complex valued signals. That have T0 as a period, not necessarily the fundamental period. OK? And this set is a vector space. a subspace of C to the R, closed under shifting, whatever. And then you had this, we had this big Fourier theorem that that associated with any X in this set, capital X T0 is a Fourier series that looks like this. Sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, ck e to the j k omega 0 t. And here's where omega 0 is just 2 pi over t 0. And the ck's are given by these formulas. And I'll just write the formulas over here. C0 is 1 over T0 integral over any interval of length T0, X, T, D, T. And CK 
Do I have a problem up there? No? OK. Just want to make sure. Integral over any over like t0, x of t, e to the minus jk, omega 0 t dt. And that's for non-zero k. And the only reason I separate those formulas is to demonstrate that c0 is just the average value of the signal. And this notation, integral sub t0, means over any interval of length t0. So associated with an x is a Fourier series, and this series converges for all t under certain conditions. So under the sort of regularity conditions, and see the monograph, this series converges for all t, and if t is a continuity point of x, it converges to x of t. If t is a jump point, it converges to the mean across the jumps. So it's to x of t if t is a continuity point of x. and to the mean across the jump otherwise. Because remember, if you're a decent signal, you are either continuous at t or you jump at t. There's no other kind of hideous discontinuity to worry about. All right, so that's Fourier series in a nutshell, without any proofs, without any, you know, like, I, I encourage you to read the monograph, the part of the monograph at the beginning of chapter 8. It goes over a lot of these things in detail about the existence of a fundamental period for every decent periodic signal and so on. Also, you can look at the video notes from fall 2011 where I went into more detail on this stuff in lecture. But I'm trying to ditch some of that detail so we can get right at the heart of the matter that we're using Fourier series as a vehicle for, which is this orthogonal expansion in inner product space idea. All right, you've seen all this. And you've also, by the way, you've, you've also seen for real valued x in xt0, you have a sine cosine form of the Fourier series. And I'm not even going to write down the formulas for those coefficients. Again, they're in the monograph, and they're easy to derive from this complex exponential form. OK, now what are some ways of thinking about periodic signals? This is something to keep in the back of your mind. And because as going forward, we're going to be talking about things related to this. So, so one sort of physical way to think about periodic <laughs> signals is as musical tones. or musical notes. And those of you who were in 2200 last spring, you heard me say that I was kind of surprised that tone and note are, are anagrams of each other. And I'm still kind of surprised at that. So why is that true? Does anyone know? There, there are two, there's plenty of things in the world like that, like vote and veto. Those are anagrams of each other. The, the meanings are eerily related, but in terms of word structure, etymology, they're different. How about this one? Three. Three words. Parental, prenatal, and paternal. <laughs> and my brother, in response to that, said, well, how about unite and untie? See? The world is full of those. Anyway, OK, sorry. Uh, all right, so one, way to, one physical way to think about periodic signals is musical tones. And the idea here is that pitch roughly corresponds with frequency. And like, for example, on a piano, if you play the A above middle C, that's called an A440. That means it has fundamental frequency 440 hertz. So for example, 
A440 has fundamental frequency 440 hertz, which is the same thing as 2 pi times 440 equals omega 0, which is the fundamental angular frequency. And if you have an A440, you can, assuming it's a decent A440, I don't know what an indecent A440 would sound like. Probably really harsh or something. But assuming you have a decent A440, you can expand it in a Fourier series. So say x is a decent A440. Then you have the Fourier series for x. So it's going to be the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of ck e to the jk 2 pi times 440. So it's going to be 880 pi t. All right. We have names for the different pieces that make up this series. If we look at the k equals plus and minus 1 terms, so that's going to be c sub minus 1 times e to the j 2 pi, or minus j 2 pi 8, or j 880 pi t plus c 1 e to the positive j pi 880. I should settle on a way of writing this down. This is called the fundamental component of x. And the k equals plus and minus 2 terms. So that's going to be c sub minus 2 e to the minus j1760 pi t plus c2 e to the positive j1760 pi t. That is called, and here's another one of those terminology depends on who you talk to kind of things. I call this the second harmonic component. Some people call it the first harmonic component. And they call it because they want to have the fundamental be something different you know, whatever, it's just like in Europe, in a Romance language speaking country, the first floor is not called the first floor, it's called the, you know, the ground floor, the rez-de-chaussee, whatever. And then the floor above that is called the premier etage, the first floor. Those kind of people would always say, this is the first harmonic, and this is the fundamental. But I don't say that. I say this is the fundamental, and then the second harmonic, and the plus and minus k terms, ck with a minus sign, e to the minus, jk 880 pi t plus ck e to the positive jk 880 pi t. That's the kth harmonic. OK, so harmonic, that's a very musical sounding word. But we use it even for periodic signals in their Fourier series when we're not talking about musical tones. Notice, <clears throat> notice that. The fundamental component doesn't have to be non-zero. Okay? You could have an A440 that has no piece of it exactly at 440 hertz. But the way things combine together creates a periodic signal that has fundamental frequency 440 hertz. And this is, this is the kind of thing that I'm not going to go into in depth in class, but I talk about it in the monograph, and I'm also going to have you explore it a little bit on the homework. So note the fundamental could be 0, but the overall signal could still have fundamental period frequency Four hundred and forty hertz. 
Okay, that's one thing to note. And another thing to note is if someone came up to you on the street and gave you a Fourier series CK to the JK 2 pi omega 0 t and said, what is the fundamental period of this signal? There's a way to figure that out from the Fourier coefficients. You, you look and you, you look for the k that's the lowest common, greatest common divisor of all the k's for which ck is non-zero. k times omega zero is the fundamental frequency. That's all in the monograph. So in general, when you have an x in capital X t zero and associated Fourier series, sum over k, ck e to the jk omega 0 t. Okay, has associated Fourier series, but fundamental frequency x has fundamental frequency k bar omega zero, where k bar is the greatest common divisor of the set of all k such that c k is non-zero. Is everyone familiar with GCD, meaning greatest common divisor? Anyway. But in particular, in particular, x in x t0 does not mean that x's fundamental period is t0, fundamental frequency is omega 0 equals 2 pi over t0. It just means that t0 is a period of x. All right, so anyway, that's just the generality stuff on Fourier series, and there's many pages in the monograph that talk about the stuff that we've gone over in the last maybe 20 minutes of lecture time. And there's also more lecture time in the old video notes if you want to look at those. But now what I want to do is I want to move on and look at these things from a whole new angle. And that's this whole orthogonal expansion inner product space thing. Okay? So, so now what we want to do is sort of approach these Fourier series from a new angle. And as I said last time, This understanding this mathematical angle is getting more and more important. If you ever want to work with signals or signal processing or images or anything, you really have to understand the general idea of inner product spaces, orthogonal expansions in inner product spaces, Hilbert spaces, all that kind of stuff. Just the general ideas of what's going on there. Wavelets, to understand wavelets at all, you have to completely understand that stuff. And Fourier series, because they're kind of familiar to us from our differential equations class or from our 2200 class, whatever, that is supposed to give you sort of a comfortable feeling when we do this inner product stuff. All right, so for now, there's a little detour. So this is going to take us a little while, certainly the rest of today and probably part of tomorrow, most of tomorrow. So the general ideas. Examples, etc. All right. So here's the basic definition of an inner product space. So here's the definition. An inner product space is a complex vector space 
let's call it capital V. And <clears throat> when I say it's a complex vector space, all I mean is that when we talk about linear combos and scalar multiples and stuff like that, we're talking about using complex numbers for those. So that is to say, the scalars we use for linear combos are complex. That's what it means to be a complex vector space. But it's not just any old complex vector space. It comes equipped with what's called an inner product. And an inner product is just a mapping from V cross V into the complex numbers. And V cross V, remember, that's the Cartesian product of V with itself. And this is into the complex numbers. And the notation is going to be if you have a pair of vectors V and W, they map to V, W with these little angle brackets around the outside. All right? That inner product has the following properties. So this is a mapping, blah, 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 that has the following properties. And I might forget one or two, but we'll try to get them. First off, let's not give them numbers. That's confusing. If I take the inner product of a vector with itself, I get a non-negative real number. And I only get 0 when v equals 0. And this is true for all v in capital V. So the inner product of a vector with itself is non-negative, and it's 0 only when the vector is 0. Second thing is, if I take the inner product of w and v in that order, I get the complex conjugate of the inner product of V and W. So overbar denotes complex conjugate. And that's true for all V and W in capital V. So it's conjugate symmetric, so to speak. That's one way to look at this. The next thing is that it's bilinear in the first argument, namely if I take C1 V1 plus C2 V2 inner product with W, I get C1 inner product of V1 with W plus C2 inner product of V2 with W. And it's conjugate linear in the second argument, if I take a V and I do C1 W1 plus C2 W2, I get C1 conjugate times V W1 plus C2 conjugate V W2. And this holds for all v1, v2, w1, w2, v, w in capital V 
and complex scalars C1 and C2. Okay, so those are the properties of an inner product. I hope I'm not forgetting any. And every, every time I do this, I say, I'm going to remember them all without looking. But I just want to make absolutely sure. So I left the page up on my screen so I could flip this open and look. I guess I've looked at some other stuff since then. Okay. Yep, I got them all. Okay, good. All right, so that's what inner product space is. Now, you may say, well, wait, well, you know, what's going on here? What, why do we care about these things? Whatever. The thing to keep in the back of your mind throughout this whole discussion is, so it turns out, inner product spaces are just like the vector spaces we dealt with in high school, and college, and whatever. And inner product is a generalization of the idea of a dot product of two vectors. So inner product generalizes the notion of dot product. And I'll put that in quotes. You remember when you first learned about vectors and dot products, you had these little arrows. And you know you had a and b, and a dot b is magnitude of a, magnitude of b times the cosine of a between. Remember that, that whole thing. You know it gave you this geometry to go along with looking at vectors, and that's what inner products do for inner product spaces. They give you geometry to go along with the algebra. The vector space stuff is algebra. The inner product stuff is geometry. So this gives us, this endows or equips, equips is a more ecumenical kind of expression than endows, an inner product space with geometry, whatever that means. OK, we'll, we'll get around to that. We'll get around to that. So it gives us, it, get, it turns out it gives us an idea of perpendicularity, all that sort of thing. What are some examples? Some familiar examples. So here's some examples. First one is CN. What, is, what does that mean to me in this class? This means the set of all column n vectors with complex entries. Okay, And what is the inner product going to be? For V and W in CN, set inner product of V with W to be equal to W sup H times V. What does W sup H mean? W sup H is what people call the Hermitian conjugate of W. Which is just W transposed complex conjugate. So 
So what does wh look like? It's a row vector because w is a column vector. When I take a row vector times a column vector, I get a number. So for sure, v inner product w by this definition gives me a number. OK, so that's an example of an inner product space. You can go and check and make sure all these properties are satisfied. Yeah, Alex. No. No, actually, you can, you can come up with different ones, I think. But don't hold me to that right now. OK, so that's one example. Another familiar example. <laughs> Uh, oh, I meant this, let's put these all in a brace. Okay, yeah. Got it? Yeah. Do you, I, in C I know you use braces, but do you use braces in other languages like that you guys know? Java. Java. See, I don't know Java, I don't know Python. That, <laughs> And I heard that Lang Tong is turning the 2200 labs into Python, so that means if I ever teach that class again, I'm going to have to learn Python. Oh well. Not complaining. Learning is fun, in my opinion. OK, here's another example. And this is a little more related to our class. L2, little l2. Remember what that was? The set of all, and here we're going to assume that the signals are complex valued. Complex valued, square summable, discrete time signals. Okay, what is the inner product on this set going to be? For two signals, say x and y, in little l2, we set x, y, inner product, equal to the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, x of n, y of n, conjugate. That satisfies all the properties inner product has to have. And finally, another one, and, and by the way, you know, I, there, this one you have to make sure it's finite. This is something you're going to do on the homework. You know, why, why does this turn out to be finite if x and y are both in L2? Why does the sum converge? That's actually not hard to show. You're going to do it on the homework. But it turns out that's an inner product. And you can probably guess if that's an example. Capital L2 is going to be an inner product space. And here, I'm not going to assume decent, but whatever. You can, you can restrict it to be decent. But actually, I'll mention that in a second. So this is the set of all complex value square integrable. Continuous time signals. And for two such things, their inner product is going to be this x inner product y equals integral from minus infinity to infinity x of t times y of t conjugate dt. And in fact, 
if you restrict your attention to decent square summable signals. What was that? No. No, it sounded like a silencer, you know. If you restrict your attention to the decent square integral, si integral signals, say, let's not do if. Let's call it, let's just call it DL2. That's not a notation I'm going to use. The set of all decent x in L2. That is an inner product space with the same inner product. Why what, am I mentioning this? Well, what's the difference between these two? That one is a subset of this one, a subspace, in fact. This one, L2, turns out to be better in the sense that if you, we're going to have a notion of convergence, that every Cauchy sequence has a limit. That one doesn't. Okay, so that's, that's going to be something we're going to touch base on a little later. All right, so these are examples of inner product spaces. Now, associated on an inner product space V, you have something called a norm associated with the inner product. So associated with the inner product is a norm. And remember, what is a norm on a vector space? It's just a notion of size of vectors. So the norm of a vector v is going to be the square root of the inner product of v with itself. To show that's a norm actually takes a little bit of work. To show something's a norm, you have to show it satisfies certain things, like the triangle inequality and blah, blah, blah. Do that in the monograph. <coughs> but whenever we're talking about an inner product space and I say the associated norm, that's what I mean. The associated norm is square root of the inner product of a vector v with itself. Now, once you have a norm, you have a notion of distance between vectors. just the norm of the difference of the two. So from the norm comes a notion of distance. If I have two vectors v and w, the distance between v and w is just the norm of v minus w. <coughs> and once you have a notion of distance, you have a notion of convergence. So from the distance notion, from that comes a notion of convergence. For sequences. And what do you think that is? If Vn is a sequence in capital V, we say it converges to V when the limit
n goes to infinity of the distance between vn and v is equal to 0. And once you have a notion of distance, you also have a notion of a Cauchy sequence. So also have a notion of Cauchy sequence in V. What is it going to mean for a sequence to be Cauchy? Vn is Cauchy. Cauchy sequence in V when, and I'm going to give you the formal epsilon n definition, it's going to look an awful lot like Cauchy sequence of real numbers, complex numbers. For every epsilon, there exists some capital N <coughs> such that <coughs> the distance between Vm and Vn in that sequence is going to be less than epsilon when both M and N are bigger than capital N. So again, it's the, the, the idea that the, the terms in the sequence get closer and closer and closer together as n goes to infinity. In the real numbers and complex numbers, we had this mysterious property that every Cauchy sequence had a limit. That's not always true in an inner product space. But it is for some inner product spaces. In fact, all the, one, the majority of the ones we deal with are going to have that property. And the name for an inner product space where every Cauchy sequence has a limit is a Hilbert space. What's that? What, what, what's that again? So, you're going to totally be tested on names. Nathan suggested just now <laughs> that I test you on names. What a good idea. No, I will have you sort them into German and French. Okay. Okay, so, so like, Hilbert's a toughie because let, let me for, put up Hilbert for. Okay, think of it like if you said. Like Stephen Colbert, if you said Hilbert, H H I L B E R T, and pronounce that French, that sounds very French, eh? Right? I feel like if you have like Hill or something, it's kind of usually. Isn't it usually German? Yeah. <laughs> Hill Gartner? You know, yeah, that sounds German to me. Okay, so let, let me just write it down first. If every Cauchy sequence in V. And Cauchy's pretty easy, French, German, right? You know that. Converges, we say that V is a Hilbert space. OK, so Hilbert spaces are, in some sense, complete. Like the real numbers and the complex numbers are complete. Every sequence has every Cauchy sequence, every sequence where the terms get closer and closer together has a limit. And that's the distinction, it turns out, between L2, the, the ones at the top there, L2, the set of all complex valued square interval continuous time signals, and the set of all decent such signals. It turns out that L2 is an Hilbert space, but DL2 is not. Now Hilbert actually was German, David Hilbert. Yeah, he, you're right. <laughs> So it turns out L2 is Hilbert space, but DL2, as defined above, is not. And the point there is that you can have a Cauchy sequence of decent signals that converges to an L2 signal, but that limit won't be decent. <laughs> OK, that's not, that's not that important to us, but I just wanted to comment that that's true. OK, so that's what a Hilbert space is. That's what an inner product space is. And 
we're going to be dealing with these for the next little while. Okay, so let's, let's look back at our examples and see what the norm associated with each of the inner products is, and then we'll be done for today. So let's look at the norms associated with the inner products. on the example inner product spaces. Okay, first example was CN. And remember the inner product on that is V inner product with W is W Hermitian times V. So if I take V inner product with itself and raise that to the one half, I get V Hermitian V to the one half. And if you do that out, that comes out to be the square root of the sum from k equals one to n of the magnitude squared of the kth component of v, all raised to the one half. And that's just the standard Euclidean norm on Cn. How about little l2? Let's look at that one. If I take x inner product with itself and raise that to the one half, that's the norm I'm talking about, I get the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, x of n, x conjugate of n, all that to the one half, and that's just the square root of the sum over all n of the magnitude squared of x of n. And what was the name we gave to that when we talked about little l2 the first time? Yeah, the 2 norm. The, the 2 norm of x. So this is cool. We, we already had a norm on little l2, and now we have discovered that it's actually the norm associated with the inner product on l2. That's cool. That's very cool. And similarly, on capital L2 and on decent signals in L2, you also have the associated norm turns out to be the 2 norm. You have integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of t, x conjugate of t, dt, all to the 1 half, which is just integral of magnitude squared of x of t to the 1 half, and that's also the 2 norm. Okay, so good news. The norms associated with these inner products on the, on the L2s are the two norms that we already know how to deal with. Okay, so next time we'll pick it up and, and go over something really important called the Schwartz inequality, and you can probably guess whether that person was German or French, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll do that next time.